Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. What you're about to experience is a free, worldwide, interactive broadcast from Ontario, Canada. We broadcast live every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Get your questions in. Join the community chat room at www.category5.tv or email us at live at category5.tv. And now, let's begin. Here's your host, Robbie Ferguson. Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV, episode number 203. It's, uh, let's see, it's August, what is it? <laughs> August 9th, I was going to say the 8th. Time is flying. Summer is going by real quick. It's good to have you here. Um, make sure you join us in the chat room, category5.tv. Nice to see those who are here tonight. Great to see you. Greg in Texas, A. Jameson, 5579, JVSCC. Ever mind. Good to see you. Yeah. Hey, everybody. All right. Tonight we are doing a uh, by popular demand. I've got a lot of emails uh, this week while I was away. And a couple of people have been asking, when can we do another <coughs> viewer question extravaganza? Sans the cough. That was unexpected. So I said, uh, well, we're going to do it as soon as we possibly can. And here we are tonight. I've got so many questions. Uh, your questions have come in at live at category5.tv. Of course, you can get your questions in uh, in the chat room as well. And I'm going to have trouble seeing tonight because I uh, don't have my glasses on tonight. So I'll be fumbling around. Fortunately, I know where the keys are. Bear with me. Who's joining us for the first time in the chat room? We'd love to say hello to you. And I'm going to do my absolute best to monitor the chat room. We have so much exciting stuff to talk about tonight. Um, as well, we've got some great uh, news stories, lots of stuff going on in the news this week. And here are the stories that we're going to be t covering in just about a uh, half hour. Uh, there was a lightning strike in Dublin uh, on Sunday, and that lightning strike took out Amazon and Microsoft's cloud computing environments. Uh, stick around, we're going to be telling you all about that. Also, the British government has admitted that the copyright laws need to be updated because they've gone too far. The, existing, uh, the existence of antiprotons, that's a form of uh, antimatter, has been proven. You may have heard it is actually available in the Earth's orbit. We're going to be talking about that. Major discovery as far as science goes. Uh, and King Abdullah of Jordan. He has approved a project worth $1.5 billion. And this project is a Star Trek theme park. We're going to be telling you about that in about a half hour time, so stick around. Questions in the chat room? Hey, everybody. Hey, Jameson, 5579. Good to see you. Old Guy Jim, brand new tonight. Nice to have you here. Love to hear uh, where you're from and how you uh, heard of the show. Nice to have you joining us tonight. Hey, TCT Rad. Edgardo says me, and I, I expect that means that you're new here. So welcome. Nice to see you. Let us know where you're from. Speaking of where you are from, get onto our website, category5.tv. On that website, you can go to About Us and the Viewer Location Map. And it just is absolutely astounding. It'll blow your mind, and you'll be able to find yourself on that map if you look around. It might take a couple of moments to load, and that is because this map actually demonstrates where the viewers that are currently watching our show are from. So here it goes. There are loads. Maxing out my browser's cache, no doubt. Boom, there you go. So you can actually zoom in. You can actually take a look around uh, the world and see where people are actually watching from at this very moment. And uh, I would challenge you to try to find yourself on that, uh, on that map. If you think it's creepy that we can tell where you're watching from, don't worry. It's actually pinpoints to your ISP. Your IP address on your computer tells us what... Uh, who your internet service provider is. So, for example, uh, our ISP here is CompuSolve, and CompuSolve is based in Midland, Ontario. So that's uh, about a half-hour drive from here, but if I go to the website, if I watch the show, it's actually going to show me as being from Midland. So it can be 
Uh, it could be rather close depending on where your nearest hub is. It can be rather far away, but it's not actually a point on the top of your house per se. I'm just watching here. Oh, hey everybody. Old Guy Jim is in the lower 48, the Tidewater, Virginia area. Was looking for video editing software and found the show. What a great find, Old Guy Jim says. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I would encourage you to fill in a, <coughs> pardon me, a viewer testimonial. I, I, you probably saw if you were watching. I chugged back a juice just before the show so I could make way for my iced coffee. And all of a sudden now I've got this tickle in my throat. That's from the juice. Um, but, uh, Jim, I would encourage you to <laughs> get onto our website, category5.tv, go to Interact and Viewer Testimonials. You'll be able to tell us what you think of the show, uh, what you've learned so far, and just give us your feedback. Oh, and I just realized we're still up on the screen. There we go. Iced coffee. Have you ever tried it? Very good. Take a pot of coffee. This is what I've been doing. You, you brew a pot of coffee, and it comes out, and you have a couple cups, and... What happens to the rest of it? Usually it gets dumped if you don't drink the whole thing. So you cool it down, put a little bit of raw sugar in there and stick it in the fridge. And when you're ready, pour a little bit of cream, pour yourself a cup of coffee. It's delish. Good summer drink. The more you know. <laughs> so I had some excitement this week. As you saw from the front page of our website there tonight, I didn't want to show my face. Didn't want to reveal my identity for, ladies and gentlemen. Oh. This, this uh, was delivered to me by a client this week because we're doing a project where I'm developing an iPod and uh, iPhone and iPad app for this customer. Uh, but what it is, what is cool about it is it allows me to see the Category 5 TV app um, on a bigger screen in such a way that you could probably actually see that. So I'm going to give it a try tonight. We're going to pull up the new version of Category 5 Technology TV's mobile app just to kind of wet your noodle a little bit and you can see what you think. There we go. Category 5 TV. Let's do this because it's cooler that way. Should be a big enough screen that you can actually see. This is the beta version of the Category 5 TV uh, mobile site. There it is. There's Jerry and I from last week. You can see, I don't know if you can make that out or not, because uh, the broadcast is rather small. We've got more info where you can actually go in and find out more info about the episode, as well as see how much bitrate it's going to use, things like that. We've got an episode list where you can actually see what episodes are available and you can click on one and it'll take you right to that episode with a photo and everything and you can hit play and once it loads there let's see if it does it there we go and there you have it so from the iPod or iP uh, the mobile app which is mobile.category5.tv. You can do all this. And of course it works on Android. It works on Blackberry. It works on many, many mobile devices. And I'd encourage you to check it out. Mobile.category5.tv. How many people are actually using the mobile site? Jot says Apple is way too slow. Referring to the load time. That would be my Wi-Fi, sir. The iPad, I've noticed now, because I do use an iPod Touch, and here's, here's something that's rather ironic. You remember the old, <coughs> the old case and what I had said about the iPod and Mac fanboys. The old case had a big old hole in the back of it so that you could see the Mac logo. I thought it was being clever. Went to the store and looked around. I've been shopping for one. I found an iPod Touch 4th Gen case which covers the Mac logo. I did that for you, my friends, as well as for myself and my pride. And then somebody shows up at the door with this. As if to say, you know, you just can't get away from it. And I think that's what's happening. I think that we're getting to the point where they, you got to admit, it's a good, good device. There are alternatives out there, and, the, and there's a growing marketplace of 
devices that, uh, that we're getting access to. But, uh, but they're pretty decent. But uh, as I was saying, the iPad, uh, this is a first-gen iPad, 64 gig, and it's substantially faster uh, as far as performance goes than the iPod Touch. Even though the iPod Touch, I've always been rather impressed with it as far as how well it works. And I love being able to surf the internet from a, a tablet device, especially, you know, this is a very portable device. Great for watching shows, uh, great for getting your, your RSS feeds and things like that. If you want to subscribe through iTunes, cat5.tv slash iTunes. Um, but, uh, but the iPad kind of takes it to the next level and turns it into um, an actual computing experience as far as, you know, bigger keyboard, more abilities and things like that, much more speed. But that said, yeah, I think Emil is uh, hitting it on the head. iPad's nice, but uh, a tablet with Linux is something that, uh, that he would really like. And I think definitely an Android tablet would be uh, something that I'd be interested in. Uh, ArcOS has, uh, or Arcos, or however you want to say it, they have some fantastic devices and a growing um, whole bunch of nice tablets that are available for a good price. Oh, Ryan, I am not going to be wearing an Apple shirt. <laughs> but, Ryan, tell, tell me this. If, if, if I showed up at your door and I said, here, have an iPod Touch, this is, this is kind of what happened because a, a viewer had said, oh, I really appreciate what you do here at the show, uh, th and they actually gave this to me. It was new in the box and said that this was a, a thank you gift for uh, basically for doing Category 5. And that, that was such a, uh, an incredibly nice gesture. Uh, and that was when the iP iPod Touch 4 just came out too. Um, and then this week, so Rye, uh, if I showed up at your door and I said, here, have an iPad, thanks for all you do, you're, you're telling me you're going to, you're going to, ah, oh, you know what, no, it's not, it's not Android. Yeah, I, got, I just am being real and just saying it's, a, it's pretty awesome. It's really quite awesome. But if I was, if I was shopping, if I had the money to, sh to shop for that kind of device, if I wasn't, if they weren't being handed to me left, right, and center, <laughs> then I, I might I might shop around for something that's based on Android. Um, that being, I would probably start with the Arcos uh, ArcOS tablets. What do you think? Tell us in the chat room. Send me an email live at category five TV. Jot would take the iPad just so that nobody else would have to suffer with it. That's so kind and selfless of you, Jot. I've always been impressed with your selflessness, your willingness to take things that are really cool and valuable. <laughs> Evermind wants to know if I code PHP on an iPad. No. I don't do anything that useful on an iPad. Um, but it's, it's, as Emil says, it's a cool toy. It's got some funky stuff. It's got a lot of games, if you're a gamer. It's got pretty good graphics for what it is. Uh, I am Boris Karloff says, I just bought a current ArcOS tablet, which I found a bit disappointing. Surprising. Now, what is disappointing about the tablet? And how much did you, did you pay? Be interested to know. I am Boris Karloff. <laughs> All right, so I've got a couple of viewer pictures that came in this week. Brian Murray uh, Brian Murray uh, was visiting York in England last May and uh, found this guy who was feeding squirrels at the park bench every single day and just thought, hey, here's a, an interesting picture that I'll send in. Oh, and there's a dove there, or a, a pigeon that uh, is, is right up there too. Pretty amazing how tame those animals are. Very cool. I have a picture of me when I was a kid, something similar with a chipmunk, but... Uh, that's nice. Ah, and he says he wants to receive a couple viewer points, even though it's not a picture of him watching the show. And because I like to encourage viewer participation, Brian, I will. Uh, how about I'll give you fifty viewer points? All right. I'm gonna write it down. Fifty viewer points. Brian Murray. If you would like to receive some viewer points, all you have to do is send me a picture. Preferably of you watching Category 5 TV, like Emil, who watches Category 5 TV on their laptop 
and some crazy shows in the background on their television set. That is multitasking, Emil. Multitasking that will get you 100 points on Category 5 TV. Thanks for, the, uh, thanks for the email. Oh, and look at this. I've got an email here from Zando, who, in fact, owns an Arco... Arco how do you say it, guys? Arcos? Arco S? I've always said Arco S, but it, how do you say it? Anyway, Zando is using an Arcos... 5 internet tablet and watches category 5 technology TV using that tablet uh, and believes them Arcos to be a very innovative company and says that uh, they would like some viewer points so this is Zando watching on the uh, the version 5 IT Agamotto phonetically says it uh, Arcos I know that's not what you mean but Arcos Really? Is that right? Arc OS 5, Evermind says. Okay, so that's the, uh, the Arc OS 5 internet tablet. And I will change the way I say it 50 times. But that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's really cool. I, I like the mobility of devices such as that. I love that with an, and I'm only using iPod and iPad as, as an example because it's what I've got at my desk and I don't have any fancy mobile devices and these these tend to be the most readily available here in Canada I don't know how it is in the rest of the world but uh, there are other devices but quite frankly Apple's got that market as far as getting um, the product into the hands of the consumer so that said it's probably the most likely one that I'm gonna get if somebody is handing one down like this is the first gen uh, that's been handed down it's used and and uh, so you know it gives me a chance to try the device but uh, yeah so here's, just from our app, here's last week's episode. And you can see how great that looks. But I am surprised, I'm a little surprised that the, the screen, see how it's, it's more of a four, I don't know if it's quite four by three, but it's not actually 16 over nine. I've got to actually zoom in quite a bit. But that's neither here nor there. What do you think? Uh, is it worth shopping around what what is your favorite uh, tablet device or what is it that uh, that you would choose if you were standing in the store and you had the options in the same price range i mean okay tonight's episode of category 5 technology tv uh, is powered by eco alkaline batteries and you will notice that this battery pack is missing a couple of batteries and that is because these environmentally friendly batteries are powering my microphone tonight uh, and they are fantastic. They are earth-friendly, landfill-safe. Check out ecoalkalines.com, and you'll find out uh, more information about them. Uh, Rhubarb is wondering about my ability to program for the iPad. And in fact, I'm not programming in, uh, in object-oriented C. I am programming in PHP, surprisingly. Because <laughs> it's amazing what you can do with server-side stuff. I am developing, uh, I develop some pretty crazy stuff, but what I'm developing is an actual server platform based on Linux that is, uh, that powers through Wi-Fi um, a network of tablets. So be it iPads or whatever. And those tablets will all connect into the centralized server. And the, the actual, what is being presented on the screen is being presented uh, via PH, PHP, HTML. Um, just like our our app, and I say app, but um, when you see that I bring up Category 5 TV, this is actually PHP. Takes a moment on the iPad. It, it has a splash screen on the iPod Touch and other devices, but this is a, this is all PHP. So everything that you see here is is done in PHP. It looks like a, like a standard app for the iPad. This has not been optimized for the iPad yet because I, I haven't had this long enough to uh, to do any testing with. So, but uh, but that's all it is. Watching the chat room here, doing my best as I am flying solo tonight. Pirate Rock, I am on Google Plus. I'm not an active Google Plus user, but I registered. I'm there. I'm using it, but. Um, 
being that you know it pretty much got registered and then went away for vacation it uh, it hasn't really happened yet um, but uh, yeah you can find me on there DJ Robbie F at gmail.com okay let's see lots and lots of viewer questions let's pull them up and let's see what uh, what you have for me this week and if I miss your question, like I say, there's there's a ton coming in, so I'll do my best. But uh, you let me know if I uh, if if I miss you, pop me a, a message in the chat room, or say hey. Um, and certainly, uh, I'd encourage you to invite your friends to watch Category Five TV as well. Uh, this is a free service. Uh, we're located at www.category5.tv. All you have to do is go to our website. You can sign up for the site if you like. It's free. Um, you don't have to in order to participate in the show, but you do get the advantage that you're going to be able to, to accumulate what's called Category 5 viewer points if you're registered. Those points uh, will build up as you use the site and as you watch the show. And with, uh, with lots of points, you're going to be able to get uh, some virtual rewards, such as um, badges and things on your profile. And then uh, there are um, going to be some options to, um, to receive things like coupons and, uh, and promos for various products, various services online. Uh, that will be coming uh, when people get into the higher, you know, five, ten thousand viewer points. So, so there's uh, lots to do on our website. Of course, lots of uh, free information there. Being that it's a one-hour show and this is episode 203, uh, so there are 203 hours of uh, video that are are currently available. Um, so you might want to check that out. I'd love you to check it out. And pop me an email or send me a viewer testimonial. Into the questions. I don't want to uh, take up too much time just jabberwalking, but uh, I've got one here from Jim Franklin who says, Well, first, let me thank you for your broadcast. Cheers. I found it while looking for video editors. I appreciate all that you're doing uh, and this on top of your day jobs. While not a novice, I installed Slackware from Diskettes many, many years ago. I'm no expert. Um, I saw your episode with OpenShot and checked out uh, KD and Live or KDE and Live. Uh, I like Sony Vegas Movie Studio, but it is Windows and very expensive. My question is, what do you use to capture DV? I tried Kino, but it appears to lock up after just a few minutes of captured video. Also, I'm running it on a Lenovo R61i laptop. Thanks from Jim. Okay, Jim, your your real you know the embodiment of your question is what do I do? Um, so when I was using a DV camera, so you're talking about DV, so SD, which is uh, typically FireWire, so you've got a, an IEE 1394 port. With that, yes, I was using Kino. No, I did not have any trouble, but I did have to. Um, I can't recall if I if I had to run Kino as a, as a root. I don't think I did, but there there are some permission issues with uh, FireWire and not running as root, so um, you could try that. But uh, that's what I did, as I used Kino for for all my importing on Linux from DV. Those are tapes, though. Um, so if I was on Windows, I use a program called CyberLink Power Director, and uh, that's a great program. I'll post uh, links for these applications in the show notes for episode number two hundred three. Uh, but Jim, uh, CyberLink is, is basically a Windows equivalent of OpenShot um, as far as what, what it does, but it also has the capture features um, and things like that. And it's got quite a few different encoders as well. It goes from capture to editing. The editing portion is very much like OpenShot. And then to publishing. And publishing allows you to send it right to YouTube or save it as files on your disk. Um, that said, what I do these days is quite different because now we use solely flash media based video cameras. So when we record video, it records to an SD card. So we've got, uh, we've got a ton of these guys laying around. This one is uh, a video from last week. And these cards basically hold the videos. It's transient. Never leave your stuff on there. If you get a digital video camera, never ever ever fill it to capacity and just leave it there I see what people tend to do and not to get sidetracked here Jim but um, I dread that they're not reliable media SD cards are so magnetically sensitive they'll drop data and suddenly stop working 
and there's no warning. I would so rather that if you're going to record to flash media, um, or anytime you're using flash media, thumb drives, things like that, never store your only copy of stuff on there. As a transient media, it's fantastic for me to record to the, to, on the video camera to SD and then import it directly onto my RAID array, my unRAID array, um, get it somewhere safe. Um, but that said, it provides extremely good quality video. We're recording at 1080p, and that video, because it's on an SD card, there is no dubbing. There is no having to run the tape in real time anymore. There's no more having to use an application such as Kino in order to get the video off of the camera. You can either connect the camera through USB and get access to it as if it was a, an external hard drive, or you can do what I do, and that's to use SD cards. And those SD cards, I just eject them and I plug it into the, uh, the side of my laptop, which has a camera card reader, uh, an SD card reader, and import the files. They're, they're uh, MKV files or something along those lines. So AVC HD, and uh, they're, they're big files, but they transfer perfectly. So that's how I do it now. Cool, hope that, uh, hope that helps. Am I missing any questions in the chat room there? If you have a question that's completely relevant to what I'm talking about, please PM me. Because as I look at the chat room, see, now I'm ready to move on. So if you're saying something that's relevant to the question there that Jim asked, or if it's something that I should be mentioning on air or that is relevant, relevant to what we're talking about, please PM me. That's slash MSG space Robbie F and then space and then your message. There you go, Jot. Okay, as it is, uh, I'll hope that that answers your question, Jim. I've got one here from Dennis who says, hey, Robbie. Is there a way to put my home folder on my pogo plug? I'd like to do this instead of leaving it on a local hard drive. Thanks from Dennis. And uh, Dennis, I, I, yeah, you can use pogo plug FS if you want. Uh, it's Fuse, right? Like Fuse would allow you to set it up as a, an FS tab entry. Would it work? Because your, your home folder, I, no, I don't know if your, I don't know if your home folder needs to be activated before you're networking or not. Probably. So I doubt it would work. But that said, even theoretically, yeah, we could probably get it working, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, Pogo Plug's a fantastic device for multimedia storage and things like that. But what you're looking to do is, is not really feasible in that it, it just it doesn't make any sense from a performance perspective because Pogo Plug is a, is a streaming media and storage server it's not, and, and distribution mechanism so that you can access your files from everywhere. But that said, Dennis, I don't believe that it would be built for or reliable enough to put your home folder on because if your internet went down, even momentarily, which happens, right? Or if you reset your router, which happens, all of a sudden you lose access to your home folder because it's through the internet, basically. It's through the pogo plug. So that could be very problematic. So yes, it could be done. Would I do it? I would say no. I would rather, if I was going to do something in that setup, I would have my Unraid machine uh, with my home folder on it because it's going to be up no matter what. Uh, it's on UPS power, it's got uh, gigabit ethernet so it's extremely fast as far as accessing my data. Still not as fast as an internal hard drive but it's going to do better than, uh, than going out through the internet and back in if you're using encryption. So, um, so Dennis, I would stay away from that particular configuration. But if that said, you're thinking, oh, but I still want to do it, then let me know. But uh, I, I would stay away from it, I think. Okay, Dennis? Sorry, not the answer you're looking for, I'm sure. I know you want me to walk you through it, but it would be too risky. Risky, risky. That said, hey, you could take your, uh, depending on what you're trying to do, but uh, you could back up your home folder to your pogo plug. Yeah, rsync. Mount it to slash media slash pogo plug. Just throw it anywhere um, with pogo plug FS. Run your backup script and get your home folder uh, copied or r synced onto your pogo plug. Then you've got a backup as opposed to actually trying to run it like mounted as your home folder. Okay, here's one. Uh, oh, you know what? We are actually out of time as far as that goes. It's uh, just about time for the news. And tonight, in honor of the iPad. Oh, there we go. We'll bring up Safari here which hosts our Newsroom website. It's newsroom.category5.tv. 
always an adventure with me here all by myself, isn't it? You think I'm unprepared? I'm not unprepared. I am just operating a lot of switches. Definitely. Wirecast makes it fantastic, makes it relatively easy for me to switch cameras, switch tickers, and even to jump right into the news. Uh, anything that I need to do through Wirecast is done uh, reasonably simply. But on a night like tonight where you're flying solo, it's still busy, busy. So, from the Category 5 Technology TV newsroom, let's see if I can do that. There we go. Boom. A lightning strike. Oh, this feels dirty. There. A lightning strike in Dublin on Sunday caused a power failure in data centers belonging to Amazon and Microsoft. Causing the company's cloud services to go offline, lightning struck a transformer, sparking an explosion and fire, which caused the power outage uh, that lasted for much of the day on Sunday, uh, with services being slowly restored as Amazon worked very hard to bring EC2 and EBS back online. Under normal circumstances, of course, backup generators would seamlessly kick in, but in this particular case, the explosion also managed to knock out those generators. Does the outage demonstrate perhaps the weakness of this infrastructure, the cloud? Email your comments to live at category5.tv and we'll mention them on next week's show. The British government agrees that copyright has gone too far. And in, in a surprise move last week, they actually pledged to enact significant changes to copyright law, including orphaned works, uh, or orphan works reforms and also uh, the introduction of new copyright exceptions. This is starting to feel awkward. Can it work like this? Yes! It flips over! As long as the apple is inverted, I am happy. The tone of the comments was surprising. The government agrees that copyright currently uh, over-regulates to the detriment of the UK. Uh, that is a quote. Um, they say that uh, CD and the author says perhaps DVD uh, ripping for personal use should become legal at least uh, and the uh, or at last and the government is even keen to see the consumer rights granted by law can't simply be taken away by contract for example uh, an end user license agreement sticker on a CD demanding that ripping is not allowed would be overruled by the government they, uh, the report is also significant for what it pledges not to do. Uh, the government says uh, here in the, well, there in the UK that it will not bring forward this, uh, the site blocking provisions uh, for, that you remember from last year's Digital Economy Act. Uh, this is evidently not referring to the power of copyright holders to compel individual ISPs, for example, to block infringing sites after a lawsuit, but more uh, that comprehensive system whereby the government had the ability or would have had the ability to demand that ISPs uh, would block particular websites. Antimatter has received a lot of research attention here on the planet Earth. But satellite data uh, re recently confirmed that antimatter particles, particularly antiprotons, are actually being held in orbit by the Earth's magnetic field. This is the first time antiprotons have been discovered trapped in the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, even more impressively, though, is uh, that this confirms past theoretical predictions of their existence. While scientists have yet to clarify if there are any practical applications for this discovery, of course, we all know that it is just what we need to power a fleet of star-faring vessels and finally meet the Vulcans. There are lots of famous Star Trek people in the world, uh, Star Trek fans in particular, but there are few who are as rich as King Abdullah of Jordan. The Middle Eastern monarch, who was actually once an extra on an episode of Star Trek Voyager, has given the green light to a $1.5 billion Star Trek-inspired theme park. It's boldly going to take Jordan where no golf state has ever gone before. While the theme park will not be powered by dilithium crystals, uh, it will utilize green technology in order to lower its carbon footprint. The futuristic Star Trek theme park will be situated in the Jordanian coastal city of Aqaba, Aqaba and uh, will be spread over a 74 hectare area. 
It will consist of 17 entertainment zones and a four-star hotel, among many other things, but no word about holodecks or transporters. Uh, in reality, it looks like the project is actually going to be funded by investors from both the U.S. and the Gulf, and the Star Trek attraction is being creatively developed by Paramount Recreation. Development is scheduled to start sometime early next year, and we can look forward to its completion. The Category 5 Technology TV Newsroom is available uh, at category5.tv slash newsroom. And uh, it's researched by Roy W. Nash with contributions this week by Roganet through Twitter. If you have a news story that you think is worthy of on-air mention, make sure you email me, newsroom at category5.tv. From the category5.tv newsroom, I am Robbie Ferguson. That's what it says right here on this iPad. Category 5 Technology TV Newsroom tonight is brought to you by Pogoplug, cat5.tv slash Pogoplug. And uh, we talked a little bit about it uh, just a few minutes ago. But we have lots of those to give away later on this month. So uh, make sure you're watching every night, uh, every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. Again, cat5.tv slash Pogoplug. Also, Planet Calypso. It's a free online massive multiplayer uh, game. I kind of mixed up those words, but it's a massive multiplayer online game. Lots of fun, and uh, you can meet people like uh, myself, like Jot, who is joining us in the chat room, and you can get in there and say hello. And uh, that is available for free download at cat5.tv slash Calypso. So, gang, it is, uh, it is busy in the chat room, looks like. Good to see everybody. Hey, Jot. Uh, my Unraid changes IP addresses when it reboots. So you do need to set that to a static IP if you put the home folder in it. That's a good point uh, that Jot makes there um, that about uh, setting your home folder. Of course, it needs to be a static IP. Uh, thanks for that, Jot. I, I may not have thought of that. Um, certainly, though, I, I couldn't see a purpose in having something like an Unraid server without a static IP when you think about it. Because it's a file storage server, you're, you're going to have your Windows machines are going to have mounted drives. You're not going to be calling it by machine name. I don't think you're probably going to be calling it by IP address, which is what I do. Um, so it's always good to have your servers behind us, uh, like on a static IP, uh, regardless. Thanks for the comment. All right. Gang, I, I, unless you PM me, I, I will uh, definitely have trouble um, following the, the chat room tonight, but I'm doing my best. K Goosey wants to know if I'm using the i7 processor at this point. Um, not yet, K Goosey, but we are working towards that goal. As you know, uh, our original server uh, got damaged in a power surge. Uh, thankfully, uh, you, our viewers, have come through for us, uh, which is just, just absolutely awesome, and we're so appreciative of that. Um, we've also picked up a couple of advertisers, and we're, go we're going to be able to replace that server with something that's, that's reasonably decent, and it is uh, looking like we're going to go with an i7, uh, 2600K, which is the Sandy Bridge. So, um, so we're going to, at that point, experience the difference between a Q6600, which was our original server, uh, and jumping up to a, a Sandy Bridge processor. So uh, looking forward to that very much, um, and in fact, uh, parts have been priced out and we're, we're getting ready to order. Uh, the motherboard that we're ordering from ASUS is on back order uh, and so that's already uh, under process. Once that comes in then we'll be able to order the rest and we'll see how it goes. i7 now has ECC, TCT RAD is, uh, is saying, that's amazing. So, and with the dual processor i7s, I could see them really making their way into uh, not necessarily a, a uh, business server environment, but certainly as a as a small business server or as a home business server, boy oh boy, especially with ECC, that's uh, that's wonderful. Hey Jameson, fifty five seventy nine. <coughs> Pardon me. I should do this, bef Andrew, before uh, before I chat with you. Mm -mm. I just realized as I look up, there's me on the website trying to hide my identity, which I, I don't know what you think, but um, looking at that picture, I'm pretty sure we have the same sunglasses. And, oh my goodness, the same outfit. 
Isn't that ironic? <laughs> How did she get a hold of my pajamas? Unbelievable. Hey, Jameson. Will the user setting up something like LDAP uh, for their home folder, uh, similar to Active Directory roaming profiles, work for having a remote home folder? Uh, okay, so not following the question exactly there. So you've got a, you, if you're using LDAP, Active Directory, roaming profiles, would it work with a home folder? I'm not sure, dude. Not, uh, not a setup that I would that I would go with, so. Cool. Any other questions for me uh, in the chat room, please PM me. Oh, Pyrus Rock says, what is ECG? or whatever it is that you just said i7 now has. Uh, ECC is error checking, uh, error correcting code memory. So it's, it's basically what you would put in a server versus the cheap consumer memory that, uh, that you typically put in a, in a work, uh, uh, home computer, like a, uh, just a desktop, right? ECC memory is, uh, it's constantly checking itself and, and I guess the way, I'm not sure as, as far as how it exactly works, but it's a higher end memory that, uh, that is less prone to blue screens and things like that than the, uh, the cheaper counterpart. Cool, cool. All right, I'm gonna jump back to viewer questions here, gang. And you can get your questions in at live at category5.tv or through the chat room category5.tv. Here's one from Scorpio55 who says, if you'd like an easy way to fix your Grub bootloader, then this application seems to do, job, uh, do the job really fine. From help.ubuntu.com. Hey, this is cool. Boot repair. I haven't used this. It's a small graphical tool to repair frequent boot problems such as repair the boot when an OS does not boot anymore after installing Ubuntu. Repair the boot when access to Grub and another, uh, any other OS is lost. Uh, allow the reinstallation of Grub and allow to restore the original boot sector. That is cool. Looks good. So this is uh, freely available. I'll post the link in the, uh, in the show notes for episode number one, uh, two, <laughs> 203. All right, there are 32-bit and 64-bit files, those are, let's see what they are. They're ISOs. So you burn it to a CD, boot from the CD. Very cool, thanks for the tip. All right, what else have we got? Live at category5.tv for my inbox. Okay, Robbie and gang, this is from Peter Lewis. Peter says, I bought myself a touchpad 11, which uses the Android operating system. I also was given, along with it, a 64-bit SD card. I found that I had a problem accessing your past show uh, videos and also watching the current, <coughs> the current show. This is apparently because the touchpad 11 does not support the Flash Player. Is it possible for you to include some way that you could watch MP4 files that do not use the Flash Player? Um, so that you can watch them on my touchpad 11. Yeah, and that could, I can actually automate that for you, Peter. I haven't, uh, I do my best to, to work with, uh, with devices, even though I don't have them. When I was setting up compatibility for the iPad and what you see there, it was, uh, uh, Corey Claxon, I believe. Was it Corey? Was it you that, uh, that came on with your iPad and through the chat room, you, you gave it a test and we, we made it work for you? Uh, Peter, what I need to know is what browser headers your device is sending to the server, and then I can automatically have it transition to uh, different file formats. So what I'll get you to do, first of all, I'll encourage you to try our mobile website, okay? Mobile.cat5.tv, that's what you saw there. I'd like you to try that on your, uh, on your tablet. Tell me, Peter, if that, uh, if that one works. 
our main website, it may resort to Flash. The mobile site will never use Flash. It does not have any Flash on it. So that might be your answer right there. But if it's still having trouble playing, because those are M4V files, and that's not listed in the compatible file formats that you give me, although MKV and MP4 are similar containers, so it's possible that they may work. So give it a try. Let me know, and we can set up to actually test your headers and see what your device is being detected as, and then we'll see if we can get it working for you. I'm sure we can. Okay, here's one from Emil. Who says, uh, I was looking for category 5.tv on my XBMC, but I can't find it. And I'm sure there were tears involved. Hey, where can I find it? Or must I install something to watch your show on it? Greetings from Emil. As far as installing something, Emil, it's not really that, it's not like installing anything. Basically, go to our website, category 5.tv. Okay? Go up to watch the show up here. I'm going to zoom in so that you can kind of see a little bit better here. Watch the show. Subscriptions and RSS feeds. When you're there, you're going to see something here, and this is what you want. The recommended feed is 480p H.264. All right? Right-click on that. Copy link address. That's what it shows in my browser. Um, your Firefox will have, like, copy link, right? Just copy the link. All right, so now in your, in your clipboard, if you look, if you paste, that's what it gave me, all right? So what we need to do is from that, well, I'll bring up, uh, let's bring up some information for you on XBMC from their help forum. wiki.xbmc.org question mark title equals rss feeds okay this is going to tell you now what to do with that link that we just copied okay there's the address i'll post the links in the show notes episode number 203 so basically get into the gui and when you're in there okay just follow the prompt uh, follow the instructions here very you can see how easy it is it's, it's not long just start here okay uh, to connect to a specific rss feed on blah 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 click on Go to add a new source under music videos and pictures section of XBMC and you'll see that what you want to do is you want to paste the link in there. Now you'll notice that this is RSS colon. Okay, that's what tells XBMC that it's using an RSS feed. So our RSS feed is in fact HTTP. So what you need to do is take that URL that you've copied to your clipboard and change it to RSS colon. Copy that to your clipboard. Okay. Now that's going to tell XBMC that this is actually an RSS feed. It's going to use the RSS protocol and it's going to grab category 5 480p. Okay? That should do it for you. Please let me know and certainly take a picture so that you can get 100 viewer points. All right? This is Category 5 Technology TV. You'll find us online, www.category5.tv. You can flatter us at cat5.tv slash flatter. And as I was mentioning before, you can get us on iTunes, cat5.tv slash iTunes. So nice to see everybody. Uh, TCT Rad would like everyone to submit their haikus. Maybe I read it wrong. That's how I read it. <laughs> Cheers, Emil. Saying that they're going to give that a try after the show. All right. Let's see what else you got for me here. I'm just going through the, the mailbag tonight here at Category 5 Technology TV. You can submit your questions to us, and uh, I will do my best to give you accurate answers. And certainly uh, our chat room and our community is a, is a fantastic resource. I'm not the only resource here. I'm just uh, kind of the, the person that you see on the screen. But uh, you can also chat with people in the chat room. They'll have answers for you as well. This one comes from Samson. And uh, Samson says... I want to install multiple desktop environments in Ubuntu. I usually use GNOME, but like many Ubuntu users these days, I'm looking for an alternative and I want to have a hands-on experience on KDE or XFCE without abandoning GNOME completely. I've seen some distributions come with multiple environments. Um, is, there no, is there not a, a, a not-so-hectic 
method of actually installing another desktop environment without breaking the existing one. Installing KDE Base or GNOME Base, for example, while running either one of them seems to mess up the environment and you end up with an ugly hybrid and a bunch of cloned applications. Thank you from Samson Abraha. Samson, um, I, I think I hear what you're saying. You install KDE and all of a sudden you get a whole bunch of applications that come with KDE mixed in with your GNOME applications. There's really generally no getting around that. Every, every um, desktop environment is going to come with some applications. However, you can install just the desktop environment package, which is going to be cleaner than installing, for example, um, you know, when you say KDE, like Kubuntu desktop. Um, you wouldn't want to do that because then you get a whole ton of stuff, like everything. But you could, uh, you could do that, or what I would suggest, if you have the power on your machine and you're just looking to try things out, I would install VirtualBox, and I would get a couple of different distributions and give them a try. Alternatively, we are working our way through. Now, we're, it's on hold for the moment because of our server situation, and unfortunately, uh, our systems are not capable of doing the demonstrations at the moment. Uh, but we are working our way through um, basically reviewing a whole bunch of different Linux distributions and, and we're looking at all different desktop environments. So if you follow along with that series, uh, which you'll see we've already reviewed several different Linux distros, uh, you'll be able to see and, and kind of judge from watching the show and bringing it up, make it full screen and see what it looks like on your computer. Even though you're not getting the interactive experience, you're able to see, hey, that's what KDE looks like. Hey, that's what Zorin OS looks like things like that. So uh, if you have a particular desktop environment that you're interested in, send us an email live at category5.tv and we'll see if we can, uh, <coughs> pardon me, if we can in fact incorporate your suggestions uh, into our reviews as we look at which distributions we would like to take a look at. Uh, but I would, if you're wanting to do it yourself, try VirtualBox, then you are creating virtual machines that can be, you can have multiple different ones installed and you could be trying them all simultaneously or one at a time and you never ever touch your, your main, what's called the host operating system. That's the way I would do it. So give that a go. Let me know what you think and if that, uh, if that helps you out. Okay, Samson? And thank you very much for your question. Moving along in our inbox, one here from Gadwill. Ah, says, <laughs> this must be the question, the question. Could Robbie show us, <coughs> pardon me, could Robbie show us how to make an actual drop-down menu in a website? I'd really like to see how Robbie would code something like this on a, on a site. I've viewed the source code, but I can't see how it all fits together. Um, so this is an actual drop-down menu, not a pseudo drop-down menu. I understand. You know what, Gadwill, sometimes there are points, and I will create menus, and I do create lots of nice menus. They're time-consuming. The CSS is time-consuming. Quite often, if I'm building a website, and, it, and it's, you know, if, it, if it's appropriate, if it works within the, within the mock-up, I'm going to use uh, Suckerfish, Son of Suckerfish, uh, as a base. I'll post links for you. Do a Google search. I'll say a Google search. Son of Suckerfish, okay? And the reason that I go with that as a base is because it's strictly ULs, LIs, and CSS. There is no JavaScript to make your site incompatible with different browsers. There's nothing like that. There's no plugins or jQueries or anything other than here, you know, in order to make it compatible with Internet Explorer. Of course, there is a workaround, as you can see. That requires JavaScript. But all that said, for all the Firefox users, it's strictly nice and clean. I would start with that. Here's how I would do it. I would go down to the very bottom where it says examples. And I would say, OK, do I want a one level menu? I click on that. And I go up here and I say, OK, that's what this is going to look like. OK? See that? Or go back. Do I want a two level menu? This is going to look like this. Oh, you know, it goes out like that. Now you see that the styling is really crummy. It looks terrible. But this is a base. See, this is what I'm saying, is that this is a base for the creation of your ideal menu. You can color theme it yourself with CSS. Uh, you, can, you can change it up, mock it up, change it. So when I'm happy with the particular demo that I'm looking at, right, I'm going to just control U, 
view the source code, and I can see that, wow, this is really just a style sheet. So throw that in my style.css. This is a JavaScript in the header in order to make it compatible with Internet Explorer, and that is simply because Internet Explorer is... Uh, <clears throat> this is a G-rated show, I'm not allowed to say. Uh, UL. There's all our menu items. See how those are? Here's the thing, Gadwell. These are text. Guess what the search engines see when they index your site. These are the menu items. Now this is, you know, this could be home, about us, contact us. They're, they're text. They look like text links as far as this, the source code goes. And you remember when we were talking about websites and development, we want our links always to be accessible to the search engines when they index our site because that's what gives us good search engine optimization. That's one of the big things is making sure that our links are readable by the search engine so that they can index them. So it's very important. So that's software, if you will. Software, it's a very simple script, but beautiful. Uh, well done and well laid out on their site, even though it, you know, it looks ugly because you haven't styled it the way that you want yet. You can theme it with the CSS, make it look as beautiful as you want. Son of Sucker, Suckerfish, I'll post a link for you uh, in the show notes for episode number 203. Give it a go, and if you like, you just pop me an email and say, you know, because this is, uh, this is happening live on the show right now, um, and we've only got four minutes left of the show, I can't really walk you through it, Gadwell. But I'll point you in that direction. You give it a go. Try it out this week. Let me know how it goes and where you get stumped. And then... Uh, if you like, let's take a look at it on a future show. Let's even extend the, uh, the web development series by one episode. Thanks, Guy. Well, Gizmo at work. Uh, a while ago, Robbie showed us a website to generate a font from our own handwriting. It worked fantastically. But I can't, wait. I can't find the link anywhere. Uh, could you help? From Gizmo at work. Well, Gizmo at work, I won't tell. That you're, that you're watching the show while you're supposed to be working. It's all good. It's all good. Here's what you do. That episode was episode number 102. That's back when, uh, in, in the Christy Burton days. Yes, I did say Burton. Uh, you know what? Go to YouTube. Dave did us a fantastic service back in those days by creating a service called The Meat. In YouTube.com, type in a search for 102.10. That's episode 102, meet clip 10, so 102.10 and you know, font, okay? And when you type that, you'll see here's the episode, 102.10, episode feature, making your own handwriting a TTF. And I agree, it's a fantastic tool, and it allows you to actually literally take your handwriting and make a, a TTF font, which is compatible with Windows, Linux, Mac, and when you type, it looks like you hand wrote it. It's fantastic. Um, so check that out, okay? Thank you very much for the question. And, uh, all right, let's see. I've only got a couple minutes left, gang. But I, I so bad... Invincible Mutant, you're going to push me over here, buddy. He's, he's got a question for me here. And, you know, I said this is going to be a viewer question extravaganza. So this is going to be... i got to fit Invincible Mutant in here, my friend. Synergy is a fantastic tool. I love that he's using the word fantastic now. You heard it here first. I have a machine at home and my office and a laptop that follows me wherever I go. What I wish I could do is ha make my laptop always the main keyboard at home and the office. The ideal case is that whenever I reach home or the office, I just, on my laptop, hook up the network. Synergy is working straight away without any extra settings. Definitely, it should allow me to log into the other machines at home uh, with my laptop, lock the screen, log out, whatever, uh, when I leave um, either place without having to set up Synergy again and again. Do you have a clue how to make this happen? I hope to hear from you tonight. There you go, Invincible Mutant. Well, we're out of time, so we'll talk to you next week. I am so kidding. Um, okay, your system, it's got to log in, right? Because Synergy has to be up. So on your Windows computers, you've got to have it set so that it auto logs in and then set the screensaver to timeout after one minute and set the password. Get Synergy installed as a service, okay? And then have it um, auto start when you turn on your computer. That's all part of the Synergy console in Windows. Uh, get the newest version, even the beta, because it has some so good features for auto detection these days. Uh, the older versions are not going to have that. On your laptop, have it also auto start, but make sure your laptop has a static IP, which is the same 
for both your home and your work network. Uh, at, it, it may not be easy for you to change it at work, but you can change it at home, change your whole network to mimic the IP blocking of your work network. That way, your laptop is always the same. So Synergy, you never have to reconfigure it. it it's just running. If it's Linux, is it Linux that your, your laptop is? I don't know if you said. I read, read that so quickly. Um, but regardless, your, your laptop, if it's Windows, run it as a service, Synergy, so that it's running in the background without having to have the GUI running. You can have it automatically start when you boot your computer. Same thing with, uh, with Linux. You can set it just to um, set an automatic program to, uh, to run the Synergy um, S, Synergy S for Synergy Server. All right, I hope that helps Invincible Mutant. I know that Synergy can be a little bit confusing in, wa in some ways, and every, you can never find a tutorial, and I can't ever give a tutorial that's exactly right for everybody because everybody's using it a, a differently. Uh, you know, I have a Windows computer, two uh, Linux computers, and one of them is a laptop, one of them's on Wi-Fi, one of them's on... And, and so my setup is completely different than the guy who's got a Mac as the host and a Windows computer and a Linux computer and, and uh, an iPad. So, uh, so it's tough. But uh, I hope that you figure it out and there's, there's lots of support out there and, and we'll certainly continue to support it. And as you know, I use Synergy um, like crazy. So I'm, I'm here for you, buddy. All right. Thank you, everybody, for, uh, for a great time tonight. Nice to see you. Uh, it's great to have so many people joining us in the chat room. Really, really quickly, I, I'm... Uh, okay, Pyrus Rock. Google Plus, my ID is djrobbyf at gmail.com. What is ACHI? I think uh, you mean AHCI. Do I need it in order to hot swap? Yes, your RAID controller needs to be running in AHCI mode if you're using SATA, because SATA will crash your computer if it's not running in, S in AHCI mode, because it's, it, it won't be hot swappable, okay? You can't unplug a drive when it's live. AHCI allows you to hot swap SATA. If you're using ESATA, then that's perfect, okay? But it may limit your ability to run as a RAID or something like that, so you might need a second controller. Hope that helps you, Led Zep, because that's really, really quick in the chat room. Okay, gang? <sighs> have a fantastic week, and I will talk to you next Tuesday night. I'm sure I'll have a co-host next week. I don't know that I'll have a, a new server just yet, but uh, we're working through it, and, uh, and we'll get there. All right? Thanks, everybody, and uh, I had a lot of fun tonight. I'm going to drink my iced coffee and sit here for a few minutes in the chat room as the files uh, prepare. So you have a great week. I'll talk to you next Tuesday night, same time, 7 o'clock, and look looking forward to it. We'll see ya.